Welcome to Lesson 8D, Gaussian Puff Model, Reflecting Ground. Last time we talked about an absorbing ground with the Gaussian Puff. Now we'll talk about the reflecting ground, and we'll do an example. So here's a quick review. Gaussian Puff Diffusion Model with an absorbing ground. We had this equation, equation one for the mass concentration. Then we also introduced the Slade Model, for which we find these instantaneous diffusion coefficients. And then what I did here was just rewrite this using our favorite identity. So we get it into this form. And then by integrating this, we got the dose and we had this equation 2a where this was absorbing. So now my goal is to write a 1r and a 2r equation for the reflecting ground. So let's consider a reflecting ground. How are we going to model this? Well, this is all very similar to what we did with the plume. And that is that we'll put an image source just underneath the ground to pre pretend that there's another source there, we'll just add that in to model the reflection. So the idea is that whatever hits the ground will reflect. So let me sketch what happens here. We added an identical source here of the same mass, mj. It's just h below the ground instead of h above the ground. And then here's our puffs at various times. So if this is time t equals zero where the explosion occurs, this would be t1, t2, etc. And you see that what's happening is we have exactly the same thing. It's a mirror image under the ground. And so this puff is growing. In the Gaussian model, these would be more circular or elliptical, but I'm drawing them a little bit fuzzy because that's more real life. But what happens is as they grow, these things start to kind of merge together when they both hit the ground. So what we're saying is that instead of being absorbed by the ground, whatever contaminant hits the ground, it comes back up as it's diffusing. And we model that by an image. You can also see that for an example case here, these two are identical. They're just kind of mirror imaged of each other. So if you have some certain concentration due to the top one, you have an identical concentration to the bottom one up here. So this portion is double whammy and right on the ground, it actually is exactly a factor of two. We had exactly that same thing happen with the plume. This is very similar to the plume, just different equations. So what we do mathematically is add a source at z equal negative h. That would be this image source here. We already have this one as our real source. Now we have an image source at z equal minus h. And so it's easy to write this equation. This is now our equation 1r. It's the same equation we had as 1a, except now we've added this extra term. So we had before a z minus h, and now I'm adding a z plus h term. And notice that these are all within these curly brackets here. So I've added that, if you write it in the, the form that I showed you above, this whole exponential term with the x and this one with the y are just multiplying each other, and they both multiply these two terms together. We still have the same Slade model. Everything else is the same. When we integrate, what happens is we get the same equation we had before, except again, we have this extra term that is added here where we have a z plus h instead of a z minus h. And now I call this 2r for reflecting. So if you have a reflecting ground, you would use this equation. If you have an absorbing ground, you would use the 2a. So that's all there is to it. Let me make a couple comments about this equation and these results. Comment one is that at z equals zero, at right at the ground, you can look at this equation and you can see that z minus h squared, if z is zero, we just have a negative h squared and here we have a positive h squared. So those are the same. And so these two terms, when we add them up, they're gonna be two identical terms. In the absorbing case, all we had was this term. Now we have this extra term and it's just multiplying by two. So the reflecting case is twice the absorbing ground case at z equals zero. Of course, this is not true at other z's. If you're looking at nose level, for example, then that would not be exactly the case, but it is the case right at the ground. Same thing happened with the plume. Number two, we can do the same kinds of analyses that we did for the Gaussian plumes. We can plot a hazardous area and we can calculate the dose at any location we want at any x, y, z. So this is very, very similar to what we had previously done with the plumes, just a little bit different equations. Number three is that you can add more image sources for temperature inversions, et cetera, to account for those, just like we did with the Gaussian plume. So this is all, again, very similar to what we had already done. Let's suppose we have an elevated temperature inversion with the bottom of the inversion being at some height ht, like we've done before. We have our source, meanwhile, here, mj, at height h. This is our explosion off the ground. 
let's consider first an absorbing ground. We don't have to do anything with the ground. But what we would do is put an image source mirror image about this bottom of the temperature inversion, because we're also going to have reflections off of that, just like it's a lid in the sky. So we would make another MJ up here. That would be for the absorbing case. If we had a reflecting ground, in addition to that, we would also need to add another source, image source down here at the same distance H below the ground. But just like we did with the Gaussian plume, if this has two mirrors, remember I showed you that picture where I took a mirror in my bathroom with two mirrors, then you got this problem where now this image here is reflected here, that's fine. But then this one also has to reflect here, that's fine. But this one has to reflect also across the temperature inversion. So you get another one up here. This one has to reflect across the ground. So you get another one down here. And you can see that this would add up to an infinite number of image sources in order to do this properly. So I just summarized that here with the absorbing ground, you need one image source, the one up here that I labeled A, to account for this temperature inversion. For the reflecting ground, you need that one plus B under the ground, plus an infinite number of more image sources because of the double mirroring effect. And you know how to do that. In fact, if you go up to our equation, we would just keep adding terms within these squirrely brackets here. And all you have to do is figure out where these heights are, the Z elevations for these sources, both plus and minus underneath the ground and above the ground, and just keep adding those. And we've done that before with the Gaussian plume. So this is all very, very similar. The, the equations are different, but it's the same principle. So you should be able to do any kind of problem like that. Okay, let's do a quick example. Chemical plant tank mounted at H equal 3.12 meters. So this is similar to previous time in that it's still hydrogen cyanide, but it's a different tank. It has a different amount of mass. So this is MJ 6.25 kilograms. It was 10 before. H was zero before in our previous lesson example. But otherwise, it's the same in the sense that we have the same velocity here, the same wind speed. Now also it reflects instead of absorbing the HCN and we're still interested in what happens to the workers downstream in an explosion. Part A is exactly the same as last time. We want to calculate the maximum safe dose, DJ max. And we did that before. Remember, we used the ST or STEL from the NIOSH pocket guide. And so we got 4,500. So that's the same as before, milligram second per meter cubed. Part B, we want to look at the same X that I had before, but these are different variables, so we'll get different answers. Ground dose level. So we're talking about ground level. That means that should be a key to tell you we're looking at Z equals zero. Directly downwind tells us that we're looking at Y equals zero, right on the center line of the puff that's moving. And then we use the Slade model, and I've said that it was very stable. So we had that up here. The atmosphere is very stable, same conditions as last time. So we'll use this particular row of coefficients. So we have the same X and we have the same atmospheric class as we had in the previous example from last lesson. So therefore, at this X, we have the same sigmas that we had previously. So, so far, everything's the same. Now we have a reflecting ground though, so we have to use equation 2R instead of 2A. And so we plug in the numbers and make sure you can get the same answer here as you work through this. We're talking about center line, so Y is zero, so this whole term becomes one. And then we're also talking about Z equals zero, so that goes away, that goes away. So like I illustrated before, these two terms become the same. So this is just a factor of two times those. So our final equation then works out to be this, where we just have this factor of two because these two terms are identical. Remember, that happens only when Z is zero. If Z is not zero, you can tell from up here that you would have to actually plug both of those in and you'll get a different answer for each of these when you're working this for some other value of Z that's not zero. When we plug in all our numbers and unit conversion here, we get the proper units. Remember, everything inside an EXP or an LN term always has to be non-dimensional, and we can see that's non-dimensional here. I got 35,200 milligrams second per meter cubed at this XYZ location, which is certainly bigger than our safe level, which was 4,500. So make sure you can get that calculation. And then now part C is we want to repeat this for various X locations and then plot dose at ground level versus X. So we're still doing ground level. So this is at Z equals zero. And center line, the sigma YI and the sigma 
zi will change with x. Those are functions of x. So I did everything in Excel. I asked how far downstream is the gas from this explosion hazardous to people on the ground. First of all, we check our algebra at 1.5 kilometers, which was our test case. For part B, we had 35,200. So that agrees with this plot for the reflecting case. For the absorbing case, I plotted that just for comparison here too. And the hazardous is 4,500, that safe level. So where is our hazardous zone for the reflecting case? Well, you see that it's not hazardous until you get to about 0.1 kilometers. And then it's hazardous until you drop below that green line again. And that would be at 6.8 roughly kilometers. So this region between that would be the hazardous zone. The hazardous line is between these two locations in X along the X axis directly downwind of the explosion between about 0.1 and 6.8 kilometers in this case. So the answer to this question is approximately 0.1 to approximately 6.8 kilometers is our hazardous line along the ground. A couple other comments. In this particular case, we're on the ground, we're looking at ground level. So if we take any value here from zero up to the blue line and double that, we get the red line. So this is exactly double at z equals zero, like I said. So we verify that just looking at the plot. Also, this curve shape should be familiar to you. It looks very similar to what we got with the Gaussian plume. Why is that? It's because these equations end up, even though this is for dose and our Gaussian plume was for mass concentration, these equations are very, very similar. We have differences here with the pies and stuff. We have different coefficients, but we have exactly the same form. So we expect the same shape of these plots. So that all looks very similar. And that's all we need to say for part C. And then part D, let's plot the hazardous area at ground level. And Again, I can give you a different Z. Make the equation exactly the way I have it here for all your problems. Put this in Excel or MATLAB or whatever. So you don't have to keep modifying your program. You should have it all the same equation for every example problem or quiz problem, homework problem that you do. Just have to change some numbers. So how do we solve this to get the hazardous area? Well, this is getting to be old hat. So I'll just quickly summarize. The procedure is to set DJ equal DJ safe, which in our case is 4,500 milligram second per meter cube for this HCN hydrogen cyanide. Solve this equation 2R for Y, and we've done this similar kind of equations several times. You get the same form that we've had previously, Y equal plus or minus sigma YI, square root of negative two natural log of a whole bunch of stuff that includes all these exponents and all these constants here. It's a very simple algebra, actually. You should be able to do that on your own. And then you solve for a range of X, you get plus Y and a minus Y, and you plot those as a function of X, and that will be our hazards area. And so this is what I did in Excel, and we get similar shapes as we had before with the plume, as we might expect. And I plot both the absorbing and the reflecting case, absorbing in blue and reflecting in red. And so you should be able to get this. So let me just give you some comments about this, and then we'll be done. So comment one, I did plot both cases, absorbing in blue and reflecting in red. Comment two, at x equal 1.5 kilometers, which is right here, that's our test case from part B, dj was 35,200 in the same units, milligram second per meter cubed, which is greater than 4,500. So we're plotting these values where dj is equal to 4,500 in both cases. And for the reflecting case, we get 35,000, which is much greater than 4,500. So this point where we're talking about our test case is definitely well inside this hazardous area. So that's my first two comments. Number three, notice this small gap right here. It doesn't start right at zero. It starts at about 0.1 kilometers, and that is because H is greater than zero. You don't feel the effect until a little bit downwind because the puff is up in the air at some elevation that's not zero. It's not right on the ground. Comment four is that this plot is not to scale. I'm plotting Y in meters and X in kilometers. So this is really not to scale at all. So the actual hazardous area is long and thin, similar to what we found with the plumes. It just looks more wide here because of the scale we chose. Comment five, you can check your calculations at X equal four kilometers. I just picked that because it happens to land at almost exactly 40. So if you test this, and I would advise you to run this through your code, if you do this in Excel or MATLAB or whatever you use, at four kilometers, you should get Y equal plus or minus almost 40. You can see from the plot, when I looked at my Excel spreadsheet, it's actually 
39.8 to three significant digits. So make sure you get that number with all these parameters at x equal four before you attempt to do any quizzes or homeworks. Make sure you can repeat what I'm doing here. And finally, comment six, the reflecting ground case has a much larger hazardous area than the absorbing ground case. We can see the red one is much bigger than the blue one. And that makes sense because of the extra source we added as a reflection. So that air pollution, instead of getting absorbed into the ground, bounces off the ground and comes right back up to you. So you're breathing double near the ground and you're breathing more air pollution because it's a reflecting ground. So you'll have some practice with this. Not much different than what we did with the plume, just different equations and different sigmas. Procedure is identical to what we've been doing for the past couple of weeks. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.